Our help is in the name of the Lord who created the heavens and the earth. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor and release to the captives. Let us pray. Almighty God, your son Jesus Christ has taught us that what we do for the least of your children, we do also for you. Lord, we ask you'd give us the will to serve others as he was the servant of all, who gave up his life and died for us, but lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I'd like to invite you to stand with me as we sing together, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, enlightened, accessible, hid from our eyes, most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy grace. Let us profess our common faith together today using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning 
Good morning. I brought along a book about Cinderella today. Now, you guys are all familiar with the story of Cinderella, right? Yeah. All right. So, you know, Cinderella had a couple of uh, wicked stepsisters who didn't like her, made her do all the work. You know, she wore all ugly work clothes all the time. And they were having a big ball for the prince. I'm sure he was Prince Charming. And uh, they were having this big ball for the prince, and his, her stepsisters were getting to go. And, of course, Cinderella really wanted to go, but she didn't have anything to wear, and she had to stay at home and do her chores. However, you remember the story. Her uh, fairy godmother somehow made her a beautiful dress and some beautiful glass slippers, and she was able to go to the ball. And she gets to the ball, and the prince sees her, and, of course, she's the most beautiful girl at the ball, right? And it's love at first sight. He falls in love with her right away. But you guys remember what happened at midnight? Everything started to unravel. Uh, you know, her, she knew she could only stay there until midnight, and she pushed her luck. And the, the dress starts to change back, and as she's running out of the palace, she loses one of her glass slippers. And, of course, the prince wants to find this beautiful girl and doesn't know how to do it. Yes? In the same in the kingdom have a different shoe size. Isn't that a good question? <laughs> There's two possibilities. The best possibility is that uh, she had a small foot. I'm guessing. That's a good question. But the story wouldn't be the same, right? If if that didn't work if out. She was so beautiful. Why doesn't he remember anything about her face? Well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> she she was back in the cinders, right? Yes. Why does, why does the shoe not disappear? That, that is a good question, too. Man, you guys, are, this is a, this is a. Did she already have fancy shoes, but just dirty? So, you know what, listen. Why is she just naked when, uh, well, when her That would be bad, too. Yeah, hey, listen, this is a fairy tale. I think Disney was allowed to put that in. No, Disney. Well, and you know, Disney is kind of interpreting a story written by Grimm's, the brother Grimm's, right? So those are all good questions. But the, the important thing is the story turns out right, right? Uh, Cinderella gets the prince. That's the important thing. And actually, that's the thing I wanted to think about because I got another story to tell you that's kind of similar. So, you know, you remember we talked about Isaac, right? I mean, we talked about Abraham. And Abraham had a son, Isaac. Uh, well, Isaac is now getting a little old. And that means Abraham's really old. In fact, I think Isaac's almost 40, and his dad decides it's time for him to get married. And so he calls his most trusted servant, and he says, listen, I want you to get a wife for my son Isaac. How would you like one of your parents to go find you a wife or a husband? Not sure, huh? Okay, anyway, I want you to find a, a wife for my son Isaac, but I don't want a wife from around here. I want you to go back to where I uh, am originally from, which was a long journey, and find a wife for Isaac there. So uh, the servant goes, and he's got like 10 camels, and, uh, and they're full of gifts and presents for the wife-to-be. He doesn't even know who she's going to be. He gets up there, and as he gets up there, he starts to pray to God and says, listen, God, this is what I want you to do. I have no idea how to find a wife for Isaac, uh, but I'm going to go to this well. You know, that's where you get water. I'm going to go to this well, and the first person that comes along, the first young lady maiden who comes along, and says, hey, you want me to get you a drink from this well? And says, not only will I get a drink for you from this well, but I'll, I'll water your camels too. I'll get drinks for all your camels. I want that to be the one. So this lovely, beautiful young lady comes along. And she has her uh, water jar. And she says to Abraham's servant, hey, listen, let me get you some water. I'll get you some water. And I'll also get water for all your camels. And I bet camels can drink a lot, right? So that's a lot of water this girl's going to draw. But that's what she says. And so right away, the servant thanks God, says, God, thank you for leading me to the right person. And uh, so he, he explains to this person, who happens, her name happens to be Rebecca that he was sent there to find a, a bride for his master's son and that God showed him that she was the one and would she be willing to go back with him. And she agreed. 
yeah, that sounds good. Of course, you know, he had a lot of presents for her and for her brother, her uncle, Uncle Laban. And um, so they all agreed that she was going to go back with his servant, Mary Isaac. Now, part of the story that, that we don't talk a lot about is, is I, always, I always thought this was interesting in the story. I, uh, Abraham's servant gave her a nose ring. How many of you knew they had nose rings in the Bible? Yeah, so all beautiful Rebecca had a nose ring. Yeah, you know, put a, a ring in her nose. Anyway, that's a, that's a side story. But so she goes back, and they're coming back, and she's riding probably on a camel. And she sees Isaac, and she gets excited. Wow, that's my future husband. And Isaac, we're told, Isaac, when she, he saw Rebecca, it was love at first sight. Just like the prince in Cinderella. He saw Rebecca, fell in love with her, and uh, they lived happily ever after. Maybe not. Not quite. But anyway, they had a wonderful, wonderful marriage. So great story, right? So Isaac got a wife. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the way that you provide us with the things we need for this life, and you provide Isaac with a wife. And we really believe that uh, as we go through life, that you, you will guide and direct us in all things. Lord, help us always to put our trust in you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. A few announcements. I uh, want to remind uh, elders that we have a session meeting tomorrow evening here at church at 7 o'clock. Uh, also, this Tuesday at 2.30, we're going to be having our Tuesday afternoon Bible study. So I invite you all to come. Uh, we'll actually be probably, more than likely, finishing up the book of Galatians uh, this Tuesday and be thinking a little bit about what we want to start uh, next time we meet, what book we're going to be looking at next. Uh, a couple of significant birthdays happened last week, and uh, this morning I woke up thinking about it and thought, you know, I really should have said something last Sunday before the birthdays, not until after the birthdays. But just so you know, uh, on Tuesday, uh, Elizabeth Garrett turned 96, which is kind of amazing. Um, and then on, uh, on Thursday, Dorothy Powell turned 90. Uh, so, uh, you know, kind of uh, significant milestones in the, in the life of our congregation. Uh, as part of our prayer time today, we're going to be praying for the nation of Spain. Uh, Spain has 48 million people. 56% uh, 50 per, of the country is Christian, predominantly Roman Catholic. 40% uh, of the country is non-religious. Um, I always get this information from Chris, otherwise I would, certainly wouldn't know that it is, it is a, par, a parliamentarian constitutional monarchy. Uh, but basically, it, uh, it, the government is very similar to England. Uh, the prime minister's name is Pedro Sanchez. Uh, just a few things about Spain. A really very profound transformation took place in Spain uh, back in 1978. Uh, 1978, uh, the nation of Spain abandoned their dictatorship and uh, became a democratic country and really made significant changes in the country. Um, really brought about a lot of wealth, a lot of integration into the European uh, economy, uh, and so, very positive change. Some of the negative side uh, is the nation has really been caught up in a lot of materialism as well as hedonism. Uh, Spain's birth rate is one of the, the world's lowest. Uh, you know, we, and we often think of Spain as a, as a Catholic nation. Uh, well, only 17% of Spanish people attend Mass. Uh, and so, church attendance in Spain is very low. Uh, so we will keep Spain in our prayers today. Good morning. Please stand and join us in singing our first hymn, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one, 
his wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Enough for me that Jesus saves, this ends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul, I come to him, he'll never cast me out. I need no other argument, I need no other is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Our next hymn is Alleluia, Sing to Jesus. Alleluia, sing to Jesus is the scepter, is the throne. Hallelujah, is the triumph, is the victory above. Hark the songs of peaceful Zion, Flood. Jesus, out of every nation, has redeemed us by his blood. Alleluia, not as orphans are we left in sorrow now. Hallelujah, He is near us. Faith believes nor questions how. Though the clouds from sight received Him, when the forty days were o'er, shall our hearts forget? His promise, I am with you evermore. Alleluia, bread of heaven, you on earth our food and stay. Alleluia, hear the sin. Or friend of sinners, earth's redeemer, plead for me. Where the songs of all the sinless sweep across the crystal sea. Our next hymn is Have Faith in God. faith in God when your pathway is lonely. He sees and knows all the way you have trod. Never alone are the least of his children. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. He's on his in God. He watches o'er his own. He cannot fail. He must prevail. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. 
God, when your prayers are unanswered, your ear is plea he will never forget. Wait on the Lord, trust his word, and be patient. Have faith in God, he'll answer yet. Have faith in God, he's on his throne. Have faith in God, he watches o'er his own. He cannot fail, he must prevail. Have faith in God, have faith in God. Have faith in God, though all fail about you. Have faith in God, He provides for His own. He cannot fail, the wall kingdom shall perish. He rules, He reigns upon His throne. Have faith in God, He's on His own. Have faith in God, He watches o'er His own. He cannot fail, He must prevail. Have faith in God, have faith in God. You may be seated. <clears throat> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, what an amazing God you truly are. Though we think about the fact that you are the God who sits enthroned in heaven, that you are the Almighty, that you reign over all, that all things were created by you and for you. But Lord, really the amazing thing to us is how much you love us. Lord, that you have revealed yourself to, a God, to us as a God who is gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, and rich in love. A God who is always with us, a God who is always there in our time of need. Lord, help us to be filled with awe and wonder at who you are. And Lord, help us learn how to walk with you moment by moment, day by day. Lord, we're thankful that in your mercy you have promised us that when we confess our sins to you, that you will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Lord, we, we pray that you would forgive us today for our many shortcomings. Lord, forgive us for our selfishness. Forgive us for our fearfulness, for our faithlessness. Forgive us for not loving you with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind. Forgive us, Lord, for not loving our neighbor as ourselves. Lord, we are thankful that you have forgiven our sins that you have given us the gift of faith, that you have poured out your Holy Spirit in our lives that continues to be at work within us. Lord, today we give you thanks for your word and how it instructs us, how it teaches us about your character and instructs us in the way that we should live our lives. Lord, help us to be attentive to the words that you have for us. Lord, we also give you thanks for the many other books that you have blessed us with that Bring inspiration and insight, comfort and joy. Uh, Lord, we're thankful that you have provided us with the essentials of life as well as every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Lord, help us always to be people of gratitude who do not complain but are content with the things that you have blessed us with. Lord, today we also pray that you would be with the mission work of this congregation Lord, we ask you to open up opportunities for us as individuals and, and a body of Christ here to share the good news with those around us, to show your love, to reach out to all. Lord, we pray that you would be with the missionaries that we are supporting. We, we're thankful, Lord, for the way that they have answered your call and that they have gone to the places where you have sent them. Lord, we ask that you would provide for their financial needs as well as any other need that they might have. Lord, we ask you to be with Jean Ledkers and the work that she continues to do at San Pablo Seminario in Mexico. Lord, we're thankful for the many decades of service that she has given there and just pray that you continue to bless her work. 
Lord, be with Doug and Diane McClintock and the work that they're doing in Hungary. Uh, Lord, be with them as they continue their work of planting new churches in that country. We pray that their ministry would be fruitful. Lord, be with Derek and Camille Porter, young missionaries in Thailand. Uh, Lord, we're thankful for the way that they have really learned the language and the culture and just ask that you'd bless them in their work. Lord, we ask that in the future, as in the past, you would continue to raise up laborers to go out into the harvest field, and all that hear your call to go would be faithful to you and would be fruitful in their labors. Lord, today we pray that you'd be with the nation of Spain. Uh, Lord, we're thankful for the rich Christian heritage of this country, and Lord, we are a little bit saddened by uh, how few people in Spain attend worship anymore. We just pray that that might change, uh, that people would have a, a real desire to get to know you better, a real desire to gather with your people and to worship your great and holy name. Uh, Lord, we pray that Spain would wake up to the lies that have blinded it to the truth of the gospel. Lord, we pray that you would bring this nation to repentance uh, and that Christianity might once again be a, a moving force in that country. Uh, Lord, we pray for renewal and for new life within the Catholic Church of Spain. Uh, just pray that your spirit would be at work in the lives of the priest and in the lives of the people. Lord, we also ask today that you'd be with your Prime Minister, Pedro Sanchez. Lord, we ask that you'd grant him your wisdom, uh, that you would really guide and direct him as he seeks to give leadership and guidance to this nation. Lord, be with each of us as we go through this coming week. Lord, help us really to be sensitive to the needs of those around us. Lord, fill our hearts with love. Uh, Lord, we just pray that we would learn to love everyone. Lord, we ask this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We've already talked about all the many give, good gifts that God has bestowed upon us, and this morning we want to give of ourselves. If you would like to make a monetary gift to the congregation, there's an offering plate on the table in the back. As you listen to our special music, just in, encourage you once again to renew your commitment to Christ and offer yourself to him.
Heavenly Father, indeed, we are thankful for your many good gifts. Lord, we're thankful for the gift of music. Lord, we're thankful for the gift of sight. Lord, we're thankful for the gift of giving. And ask, Lord, that we would be joyful givers and generous in all of our giving. Lord, we also give you thanks today for your word. And as we hear your word read and proclaimed, we pray that you'd give us ears to hear what it is that your spirit is saying to the church. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture lesson today is from Romans chapter 4. Uh, I am going to begin reading at verse 13 and read down through verse 25. Let us hear God's word. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist, hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, According to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. Thanks be to God for his word. At times, uh, at least for me, the first part of the book of Romans has felt a little bit redundant. Uh, let me assure you that, that Paul is going to move on to other topics as the book continues. But the first part of Romans, particularly the first six chapters, Paul seems to really be driving certain points home to his readers. If we remember back to Romans 1.18 through chapter 3, verse 20, he really pressed home this point of the need for salvation and the plight of the human race. Uh, he pressed that point home. In fact, at times we almost felt like maybe he overstressed uh, the wickedness of our race. Uh, and yet he felt like it was an important point that he needed to make. Uh, the sinfulness of humankind. In fact, it is an important point. Uh, it's a truth that a lot of people today don't grasp, do they? Uh, I run across people all the time who think, I'm a good person. Or who think, what need do I have of salvation? Uh, and so because people don't understand their condition or their need for salvation, uh, there's no really great appeal of the gospel. And so Paul really presses that point very strongly. The second thing he has really stressed very strongly is this idea that a person is justified, a person is made right in God's eyes, not by what they do, but by faith and by faith alone. Justification by faith alone is something for us Christians uh, is something we learn in our creeds, uh, learn in our confessions, and yet it is a foreign idea and was a foreign idea to the people of Paul's day. It was a foreign idea both to pagan 
and to Greek listeners. In fact, Paul had a lot of opposition on this doctrine, particularly from his Jewish audiences. And yet here again in this passage, he tells us that Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Uh, in, the, in the message we looked at last week in the first part of uh, Romans chapter 4, he, really, he emphasized the fact that a person is not saved by circumcision, but they're saved by faith apart from circumcision. So whether a person is circumcised or uncircumcised, their salvation is dependent upon faith. This week, he moves his focus from circumcision to the law. And basically, the point he's trying to make in, in this part of Romans 4 is that a person is saved by faith apart from keeping the law. A question people in the first century always wanted an answer to, and I think people today still want an answer to, is how does one get in a, in a right relationship with God? If I want to have a relationship, a right relationship with God, how do I get that? And basically, there are two possibilities, and they happen to be mutually exclusive. The one possibility is we get into a right relationship with God by human effort. That would be the Jewish response. You want to be in a right relationship with God? The way you do that is by keeping the law. And so it's through human effort that we gain this right relationship with God. The pagans, basically kind of the same idea. For the pagans, it wasn't so much keeping the law. For the pagans, they thought, hey, the way I can get into a right relationship with God is through appeasement. And I appease the gods by offering them my prayers and sacrifices, worshiping in their temples. And Either way you look at it, whether the Jewish answer or the pagan answer, it all has to do with human effort. In fact, that's part of the thing that sets Christianity apart from all other world religions, right? You can look at any other world religion, whether it's Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism. It all has to do with human effort. How do I get to God? How do I get in this right relationship? It's something I do. And so it's through human effort. Christian cults often fall into that same trap, right? It's through human effort that I get into a right relationship with God. And so the, the Jewish thought was, okay, I can get in a right relationship with God by meticulously keeping the law. There's a problem with that. I can point out a few problems. I'm sure there are a multitude. Well, one, you can't keep the law. So you're, you're never going to achieve what you need to achieve. But there's some other issues. The law can diagnose the malady, but it cannot produce a cure. Uh, there's the old adage that you can chain up a mad dog, but it's still a mad dog, right? And in essence, that's what the Pharisees and the Jews were trying to do. Well, I'm a, I'm a mad dog, but the, I can use the law to chain myself up. And so they're trying to use the law to prevent themselves from doing things they shouldn't do. And so, in essence, the law, the law was acting like a chain upon them, but they, they, on the inside, there was no change. Uh, and so it's this human effort. And so the idea that the law can show where you're going wrong, but it can't help you avoid going wrong. Uh, and so these are part of the issues. And so in, in verse 15... Paul says this, the law brings wrath. Why does the law bring wrath? The law brings wrath because when the law is broken, there needs to be justice. And so this is just one more part of the problem with the law. And so this is one way that people have always thought, okay, this is how I get in the right relationship with God, is it's human effort, it's what I do. Paul says, but... There's another way. There, there's the right way. And, and like I said, these are mutually exclusive. It's either one or the other. And he's saying the way you get into a right relationship with God is not by human effort, but it's by divine grace. It's by God's grace. Um, he says an interesting thing in here. He talks about um, the promise 
that Abraham would inherit the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And then when we drop down to verse 16, he, it, it kind of comes around to us. And he says, for this reason, it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace. I'm looking at that this week and I think, what is the promise he's talking about? When he's talking about the promise to Abraham, it, it seems to be the promise to inherit the world. Uh, what is the promise to us that has to be received through faith? Uh, the commentator Schreiner says, that what he's talking about here is the world to come. What he's talking about here is our final salvation. And that, that really makes sense, not only for us, but even for Abraham. Um, there's a passage in, in Hebrews 11 which, which talks about the faith of Abraham. And, you know, we're thinking about, okay, what, what is God's promise to Abraham? Where it seems to be this promise of a multitude of descendants and, and the promised land which was part of the covenant. But when you turn to Hebrews, you realize, no, actually, the promise to Abraham was more than this life. Uh, it really had to do with the life to come. And so we read this in Hebrews 11. For he, that's talking about Abraham, he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And so he's, he's looking forward to a city and this city that the writer of Hebrews is describing has nothing to do with an earthly city. It has to do with the city that is in heaven. And so he goes on to say the, this, and he's talking about not just Abraham, but the other patriarchs as well. All of these died in faith without having received the promises, but from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth, for people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. And so we see even with Abraham, he's actually seeking a homeland that's not on this earth. He's seeking for a better homeland that was in heaven. And so this is the promise that Paul is talking about here. And he's saying, the reception of this promise is based not on law and keeping the law, but on the righteousness of faith. It's based not on our merit, but on God's faithfulness and his generous heart. And he goes on to talk about the fact that Abraham took God at his word. God said it, and so I believe it. Uh, do we do that? Do we take God at his word? Because that's really what faith is, isn't it? It's taking God at his word. Let me, I'll give you a simple example of what it means to take God at his word. Think about the, uh, probably the most popular verse in the whole Bible, at least for Christians, is John 3.16, right? And what John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So if I just take that one verse and say, okay, I'm going to take God at, at his word. What am I saying? Well, the verse begins, for God so loved the world. Do I believe that? Do I believe that God loves me? That's taking God at his word. Yeah, God loves me. Another thing with taking God at his word in that verse is, whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So do I take God at his word? Do I believe that if I believe in Jesus, then I will have eternal life? That is a statement of faith, and that is taking him at his word. He goes on to also, again, talk about grace, the gift of grace, and we understand... A gift of grace is always unearned. Otherwise, it wouldn't be grace, right? So it's unearned. It's unmerited. And so he says, for this reason, it depends on faith. Uh, in order that, in, in verse 15, uh, verse 16, in order that the promise may rest on grace. Uh, if the promise that God has given us was dependent on us, it would probably become void, wouldn't it? I can just imagine what would happen. Uh, God would probably come to me and say, uh, sorry, that promise just expired. <laughs> right? 
And the reason that promise expired is because you didn't keep your part of the bargain. That'd be true, right? Some, somehow I always fail to keep my part of the bargain. And wouldn't it be terrible if God's promises expired? But they don't, right? And, and, and so Paul says, look, it's not dependent upon you. God's promises aren't going to expire. And uh, you receiving that promise does not depend on you. It depends on God's grace. And so there's two ways to get into a right relationship with God. And only one of the two works. All right? Human effort or divine grace. And it's divine grace that is the one that works, that gets us into a right relationship with God. Paul goes on to say an amazing thing about the God in whom Abraham believed. He says this in the second half of verse 17. God who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. What does it mean that God gives life to the dead? Well, we can point to instances in Scripture where there were actually people who were actually physically dead, right? And God brought them back to life. So he gave life to the dead. In fact, Jesus, right? He, Paul is going to mention Jesus in verse 24 that, in fact, God did raise Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. And so Jesus is a prime example of someone who was dead that was raised back to life. Uh, he gives life to us. Now, I don't know about you, but I haven't died yet. But uh, in a sense, before we come to Christ, we are spiritually dead. Uh, Paul talks about in Ephesians, uh, while we were still dead in our sins, he's talking about spiritual death. While we were still dead, God made us alive in Christ. So we have, in a sense, we have already been brought from death to life in a spiritual way of speaking. Uh, but he's also probably here referring to another type of being, bringing life from the dead. And that is, he, he's going to mention that Abraham's body was as good as dead. And though Abraham's body was as good as dead, God brought life to his body and made it possible for him, for Sarah, and for him together to conceive. And so, in a sense, Abraham is dead, for the most part. Uh, as good as, interesting that Paul says, Abraham was as good as dead, and yet God brought life out of Abraham. He also says, not only does God give life to the dead, but he calls into existence things that do not exist. Uh, that's an amazing thing. Uh, you and I are created in the image of God. For, for me, one of the, you know, what does it mean to be created in the image of God? It, it means a lot of things, but I think one, one of the things that, that make us unique in the animal kingdom is creativity, right? And God has given us the gift of creativity, which is after his image. And so people take things and make amazing things, right? Uh, our very own Valerie made these, uh, what are we what am I thinking? Ta thank you. These tapestries. That, I mean, that's like a gift, right? But the, that gift of creativity that God has given us. But in order to do that, you have to have the right fabric. Uh, you have to have the right thread. You have to have a loom, right? Uh, the pews in the church, beautiful. But in order to make a pew, you have to have wood. And so, you know, as creative as we are, we cannot make anything out of nothing. But God does. So God can take nothing, this is scientifically impossible, God can take, take nothing and make something, right? Uh, and so, so we're told here that God calls into existence things that do not exist. This is the God Abraham served, the God Abraham believed in. He can call, he can give life to the dead and call into existence things that do not exist exist. And so Abraham's faith was that he believed in the God who makes the impossible possible, which is exactly what happens, right? You have another outstanding example of Abraham taking God at his word. He believed God could make 
the impossible possible. He believed that he could become the father of many nations. And so in spite of natural circumstances, in spite of what the doctor would have told Abraham, right? If Abraham would have gone to the doctor and said, you know, uh, doctor, Abraham and, Abraham and Sarah, myself and Sarah want to have a baby. What would the doctor say? Uh, Abraham, I, I know that's your desire. Have you thought about adoption? Uh, right? Because this just is not possible. And, and yet, what are we told about Abraham here? We're told that despite the natural circumstances, he did not weaken in faith. No distrust. To me, that's amazing. No distrust made him waver. This is the strength of his faith. God said, I'm going to have a, a child. I'm going to have a child. That is his faith. How about our faith? Is our faith, you know, we need to work on this. Is our, our faith like that? Uh, years ago, I don't know when it was written, um, J.B. Phillips wrote a book called Your God is Too Small. I don't know if you've ever read the book, but I just like the title. Your God is Too Small. In the introduction to the book, uh, J.B. Phillips says this, the trouble with many people today, and just to put this in context, I think he wrote this book, it was probably 75 years ago. And so what was true 75 years ago is probably more true today, right? So he says this, the trouble with many people today is that they have not found a God big enough for modern needs. A great little book. Your God is too small. Do we believe the end of verse 17, God can give life to the dead and call into existence the things that do not exist? Do we have the faith of Abraham? He tells us again in this passage, our faith will be reckoned to us as righteousness. And what is it that we are to believe? He says, it will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses, and was raised for our justification. Two parts to that. He died for our trespasses, but then he was raised that we might be justified in God's sight. So both are important, the death and the resurrection. For me, and hopefully for all of us, the fact that a right relationship with God is a gift rather than something we have to work for, should make a difference in our life. Think of the difference this should make. Okay, I, I'm in a right relationship with God now, and it had nothing to do with what I did. But it has everything to do with his grace. I no longer have to serve God out of fear, but I serve God out of love, right? That's what those pagans were doing. They were fearful of these gods. I've got to appease the God. The Jews the same way. So they're serving God out of fear, whereas we can serve him out of love. God's already done it. And now I can live my life in love of him. I do the right thing, not because I have to, but I do the right thing out of gratitude for what God has done for me. Uh, Isaiah 41.8, there's a, there's a wonderful phrase in that verse um, where it talks about, well God, well, God is talking to Israel, and he refers to Abraham as my friend. Now, that's pretty remarkable, isn't it? God calls Abraham his friend. Um, Abraham was the friend of God. God loved Abraham. Abraham loved God. Uh, wouldn't that be wonderful for God to be able to refer to us as my friend, uh, to be the friend of God. You know, at, at times we find it hard to trust God's promises, uh, and yet Abraham's a wonderful example, isn't he? Uh, a long wait. 
how long did Abraham have to wait? And yet no mistrust made him waver. Um, maybe there's some promises in, in Scripture um, that you've been waiting a long time for. Or maybe God has promised you something that you felt like you've been waiting a long time for. Um, Abraham, wonderful example. You know, he's waiting and waiting years um, for God to fulfill his promise. And yet we're told that he continues to trust and he doesn't waver. Uh, and so to follow, follow this wonderful example of faith. And in fact, that, that's what Paul is doing, right? He's holding up Abraham. Here's a, here's a man of faith. Follow his example. His righteousness was through his faith, not through keeping the law. In fact, the law wasn't even around. The law wouldn't be given for another 500 years. Abraham was reckoned righteous because of his faith. And so we should follow that faith. Faith that leads to salvation, but also just learning to, to day by day put our trust in God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word to us today. We're, we're thankful for this truth that we can enter this right relationship with you, not based on our own effort, but based on your divine grace uh, and the way that you have freely bestowed it upon us. Uh, Lord, help us day by day to grow in our faith and to grow in our trust. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to stand with me as we sing our closing hymn, The God of Abraham Praise. The God of Abraham Praise, who reigned enthroned above the ancient God of love.
you go nowhere by accident. Where you go, God is sending you. Where you are, God has placed you there. The Christ who dwells within you has something he wants to do through you where you are. Believe this and go forth in his grace, in his love, and in his power. Amen.